Hi, everybody. Welcome to the 37th annual Penfill Winter Woodlock Conference. Looks like we've got uh, lots of folks already coming in, so I, I think we'll just uh, we'll just get started. Um, so my name is Olivia Foster, and I'm the communications coordinator for the Ontario Woodlot Association, and I'll be moderating today's session. I'd like to start by thanking the organizing committee, uh, Dorothy Hamilton, Martin Strait, uh, Jim, Jim Hendry, and other folks from Stormont, Dundas, and Glengarry Chapter of the Ontario Woodlot Association, um, as well as folks from the Eastern Ontario Model Forest. Uh, the planning committee has put together a great lineup of speakers for the month of February, and I'll just turn it over to Martin now to say a few words on behalf of the organizing committee. Thanks, Olivia. I'll just, uh, I'll be very brief. I just want to welcome everybody. These uh, switched to the virtual conferences have had some pluses and minuses. Uh, we do miss getting together, but we really appreciate how many people have been tuning in and the fact that we can get a speaker like Art to come from Sault Ste. Marie is fantastic. I just want to uh, wish everyone uh, greetings from Dorothy Hamilton. Dorothy couldn't make it today. She's our president of, um, I'm sorry, I'm a member of SDNG chapter and uh, Dorothy and Jim and I put this little uh, lineup together, but Dorothy is the person who keeps us all on track and keeps us going. So uh, hopefully she'll be with us next week and she can take over this uh, this job. That's all I have to say, Olivia. Thanks so much, Martin. Um, so I'd like to just turn everybody's attention to the slide on the screen and thank all the supporters um, for all of their assistance with sponsoring the Kemphill Winter Woodlock Conference this year. Um, many folks continue to support ongoing throughout the years and it's it's very appreciated. Um, so before we get started, I'll just go over a couple of basic housekeeping items. Um, so all participants' cameras and microphones are muted, except for the panelists. You'll also see that there's a Q&A box at the bottom of the Zoom screen, and so we encourage you to type in any questions that you have throughout the presentation into that Q&A feature. Um, if you'd prefer to ask your questions out loud, you're welcome to click the button that raises your hand, and we can unmute you during the Q&A session. Um, however, we will wait until the end of the presentation to do the Q&A. Um, lastly, as well, I'll just mention that this presentation is being recorded and it'll be shared with everybody who has registered for the conference. Uh, so without further ado, I will pass it over to Executive Director of the Ontario Woodlot Association and Eastern Ontario Model Forest, John Pino, to introduce today's speaker. Thanks, Olivia. And it is a real pleasure and honor to introduce Art today. Um, I think I first met Art when I worked for the Forestry Research Partnership and Tembeck back in the early 2000s. There was kind of a standing joke that any field site visit led by Art meant that you had to have sturdy and leak-free rubber boots because we were heading into some very wet areas to see his studies. I seem to remember a lot of black spruce swamps and uh, Fortunately, we don't have to with this virtual situation today wear our rubber boots, but maybe we do. I don't know. Or, I, I don't know if you have some kind of magic that sprays <laughs> swamp water through the, through the computer system. Anyway, a little bit about Art. Uh, he earned his degree in forestry at the University of Toronto in 1979. That's yeah, a few years before me, Art. Jeez. He worked as a, I was, I was at another university though. He worked as a research scientist at the Great Lakes Forestry Center for 34 years in Sault Ste. Marie and was very productive with lots of good, good studies and published papers and, and all that great stuff that research scientists do. Um, as I say, I've always enjoyed Art's presentations and his presentation style. I've had the pleasure of seeing him make, uh, make uh, these kinds of presentations on a number of occasions, including one in Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan, I remember. Uh, we'll certainly learn a lot, of course, but um, what I like is art usually includes a few very funny anecdotes delivered in a, a wry kind of way that has his audience in stitches. And I know that was the case for me. Uh, no pressure to be a comedian today, <laughs> Art, but one can always hope for a few belly laughs in and amongst all the great information you're gonna share. So Art's retired now after retiring. Um, he started delving into the mining and forestry history of the Algoma region. He operates a 29 hectare woodlot on the outskirts of Sault Ste. Marie and is a longstanding member of the Ontario Woodlot Association. And uh, 
think I met you through the Canadian Institute of Forestry too, when you remember there, and they probably still are. Um, after he retired, Art did for a while continue as an emeritus scientist at the Great Lakes Forestry Center for a number of years, but uh, that kind of went uh, went into a hiatus or stopped when uh, COVID hit in 2020. So these days he's more uh, in, interested or more involved in historical and woodlot activity, and it keeps him very busy. So that's his focus. And, and it's his big goal to finish writing a book on the Algoma forest and mining history. So without further ado, I'm going to say thank you, Art, again, for agreeing to present today. I know there's a lot of people looking forward to it. So take it away. Thanks very much for that introduction, John. Um, and we will keep our, our feet dry. Uh, uh, John and I certainly do go back a long way. Um, I interacted with John uh, through the Forestry Research Partnership, the Canadian Institute of Forestry, FP Innovations, and now through the uh, Ontario Woodlot Association. So yeah, we've got a, a long shared history. I just want to check that my audio is coming through and you can see the slide. Can I we... will start, I'll uh, stop sharing my screen art and then you can put up your presentation. Okay. You can see, you can see it. Olivia, you're frozen over there in Ireland. <laughs> there we go. Are all good? Okay, then I'm going to get started. Yeah, super. Um, yeah, so uh, we were talking about the, the photograph here. Uh, I needed a, a photograph of a yellow birch, so I went out in our woodlot a couple days ago and took a picture of this very nice uh, a yellow birch tree reflecting the sunshine there uh, when the sun hits a uh, yellow birch it's quite beautiful um this photograph is taken from a ridge that runs along the north side of our woodlot so in the foreground is a beautiful chunk of uh, great lake st lawrence forest that i'm lucky enough to live on uh, live at and uh, it's a, a peaceful place but the title of this presentation is War and Peace, which is an allusion to uh, the, the great work by Leo Tolstoy. And Tolstoy, as a master storyteller, knew that um, peace is good, but it's not that interesting in terms of storytelling. And, and so conflict is what is really compelling in terms of story. So I'm going to attempt to tell the story of Algoma's Yellow Birch from the perspective of five conflicts. Uh, the map here shows the occurrence of yellow birch in Algoma. Uh, the colored bits um, don't necessarily have 100% uh, yellow birch occupation. They can be as low as 10%, but uh, the species occurs in a crescent along the shore of Lake Superior and uh, along the north shore of Lake Huron. And a, a number of decades ago, the, the calculation was done that this uh, piece of territory held about 40% uh, of Ontario's commercial yellow birch. So uh, not, a, not a huge part of real estate, but important in terms of the distribution of yellow birch. Uh, the first conflict I'm going to talk about is uh, has to do with First Nations. And I want to acknowledge that uh, all of the territory I'm talking about is a traditional territory of the, the Anishinaabe, uh, specifically the uh, Batuana First Nation, Garden River First Nation and Thessalon First Nation. Uh, and, and their uh, history here stretches back thousands of years. Uh, this painting is uh, was done by Paul Kane, an artist who uh, traveled throughout the Hudson's Bay Company territory and painted scenes and, and people that he found uh, in the mid 19th century. Um, the relationship between First Nations and, and non-natives for, for a couple of centuries was centered around the fur trade. And uh, uh, the fur trade started uh, in the Lake Superior area in about eight, uh, 1659 when Radisson and Grossier, along with a, a lot of uh, First Nations people, transported 60 canoe loads of beaver furs from Lake Superior down to Quebec. And this is... Uh, uh, they would have traveled through this particular patch of water, which is St. Mary's River. And so, yeah, that fur trading was, was the main relationship between natives and non-natives. But that um, started to change very quickly in 1846 when Paul Kane 
painted this uh, this painting. And the the clash that happened was over copper. Uh, there was a copper boom uh, around Lake Superior and on the north shore of Lake Huron. Uh, it started in uh, the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, uh, but copper was discovered in uh, along the shore of eastern shore of Lake Superior and the north shore of Lake Huron. Um, there had been no treaties signed over this territory, uh, but non-natives were uh, prospecting. Um, the, the government at the time started issuing uh, mining locations, so selling pieces of property to uh, would-be miners, some large corporations from uh, Montreal and Quebec City. And uh, a couple of mines started, one uh, in 1846 at Bruce Mines and in 1847 at Pointer Mines. Um, the native point of view was that uh, they owned the copper. This was their copper, but it was being mined by uh, non-natives. So uh, Chief Chingwakansi of the Garden River uh, First Nation traveled to Montreal twice to meet with Lord Elgin, the Governor General of the province of Canada, to uh, try to come up with some arrangement that would be satisfactory to both sides, but uh, that didn't result in much action. So the First Nations took a different tact in 1849 and organized a raid on the mine at Pointo Mine. So in November of 1849, uh, the chiefs of the Batuana First Nation, Garden River First Nation, and about 100 uh, people sailed in a sailing ship up to Pointo Mines, confronted the miners there. Um, it was a nonviolent confrontation, but uh, they made it clear that uh, they didn't want the miners there and the miners uh, abandoned Pointo mines and, and that mining activity ceased. So that confrontation got the attention of the authorities. And in 1850, uh, the following summer, they sent William Robinson to Sault Ste. Marie to negotiate with uh, the First Nations on Lake Superior and Lake Huron to come up with a treaty. And so that was the, uh, the origin of the Robinson-Huron and the uh, Robinson-Superior treaties in, in 1850. The Robinson-Huron Treaty established a number of, uh, of Indian reserves, uh, and in southern Algoma, they were the Batuana First Nation, Garden River First Nation, and Thessalon First Nation, and, and those reserves are shown in orange, and in the case of the Garden River First Nation, in orange and brown. Uh, so fairly large uh, Indian reserves. Uh, the provincial, the, the province of Canada, it was still a colonial government at the time, almost immediately had um, regrets about the size of these reserves. And in 1859, they sent Richard Pennefather, the uh, superintendent of the Indian Department, to uh, negotiate a follow-on treaty. And he uh, did that with these three First Nations. Uh, there were Pennefather treaties with each of the Batuana, Garden River, and Thessalon First Nations. And he persuaded them to give up uh, much of their territory uh, for Batuana First Nation and Thessalon First Nation. They surrendered uh, the, the, nearly their entire reserves uh, and Garden River uh, was diminished by about two thirds. The treaty for uh, Batuana, uh, they surrendered the reserve in exchange for $1,200, the promise of 40 acres for each family on the Garden River Reserve and the option for families to purchase back 80, 80 acre parcels on the surrendered land. Uh, the, I guess the most po uh, positive part of the, the treaty was when the surrendered lands were sold, uh, the proceeds would go to the Batuana First Nation. So the, the end result of this uh, was there was a large territory for sale by the, uh, the Indian Department. Um, and it was rich in yellow birch. So we're going to come back to this. Nothing, nothing happened uh, during the, uh, the 19th century with this land. Very little of it was sold, but eventually it would be sold, and we'll talk about that in a, a second. Uh, the reason that not much happened was a, a very different struggle, and that was the, uh, the struggle that the early loggers had with gravity. Uh, logs being large, heavy objects, difficult to move, and loggers had only uh, human muscle and animal muscle in the form of horses to uh, to fell the logs and to to move them. So this was hard, heavy work. 
but in some cases, loggers could make uh, friends with gravity as well. And uh, due to the fact that water runs downhill and some logs float on water. So river driving was the, uh, the main form of long distance transport for uh, logs, particularly for white pine in the, the late 1800s and early 1900s. And here's a, a photo of uh, a very large amount of white pine logs on the Mississauga River in the late 1920s, uh, headed for the, uh, the very large uh, Blind River white pine mill. Now, I, Art, if I, I could just uh, jump in there for a second. The audio is just fading in and out a little bit. It's getting louder okay. and uh, quieter. Yeah, if you could just move uh, a little I'll bit move closer up. to the computer, that would be great. Yeah, thanks for the thanks. tip. That's great. <clears throat> so, yeah, here uh, here's a large amount of logs on the Mississauga River, and uh, uh, these were white pine logs. It wasn't possible to do this with um, yellow birch logs, and the reason has to do with the specific gravity of wood. Uh, specific gravity being the uh, density of wood divided by the uh, density of water. When the uh, specific gravity is less than one, wood floats, a log floats. When it's greater than one, a log sinks. White pine had a specific gravity of 0.56, so it bobs around in the water like a cork. Yellow birch's uh, uh, specific gravity for green logs is 0.95, so it barely floats. And when it sits in the water for a little while, some of the air is replaced by water. It becomes waterlogged and uh, specific gravity goes above one and it sinks to the bottom. So river driving was not possible uh, with hardwoods like yellow birch. What came to the rescue was the uh, steam engine, uh, steam locomotives uh, on railways. And the uh, the first major railway that allowed Yellow Birch transport was the Algoma Central Railway that went north from Sault Ste. Marie starting in 1899. It was part of uh, Francis Clerg's uh, vast industrial empire that he started at the Sioux uh, around the turn of the century. So here was a, a railway headed north through uh, Yellow Birch territory. And amongst uh, Clerg's many uh, ventures, uh, he, had, he built the steel plant uh, in Sault Ste. Marie, a large pulp and paper mill, uh, um, the hydroelectric developments, iron mines in Wawa, but he also built a large uh, sawmill, a white pine sawmill, which is at the center of this photo, and a veneer mill uh, at the very left of the photo. And this was a veneer mill that uh, that sliced or, or peeled uh, mostly yellow birch and yellow birch that came down the Algoma Central Railway. That uh, started in 1903. The, the veneer mill only ran for about uh, seven years. Uh, the Algoma Commercial Company claimed that uh, it was uh, had enough capacity to supply all of the veneer needs of Ontario, but it didn't run for that long. And I, I would be speculating that perhaps it closed because they vastly overestimated the demand for, for veneer, for hardwood veneer. So it, it didn't run for very long. Uh, a longer ru running operation was to the east on St. Joseph's Island. This was uh, a sawmill that was established by the Stone Lumber Company in the town of Marksville, which is now Hilton Beach. And they also used a logging railway to deliver logs to that mill a sawmill, not a, a, a veneer mill. And so that logging railway stretched to the uh, southwest uh, of Marksville uh, to uh, the bottom of a feature known on St. Joseph's Island as the mountain. And there were some very, very high quality and large yellow birch and, and uh, sugar maple in that area. Here's a, a photo from 1916 of the uh, the St. Joe Island, the, the Stone Lumber Company uh, railway with uh, some gentlemen posing on one of the rail cars with a few logs. And on the right, they're demonstrating how to uh, load these heavy logs. And that's a yellow birch log that they're loading onto the, uh, the rail car. Here's the uh, uh, Baldwin locomotive uh, pulling a train of hardwood logs uh, into Marksville uh, to be sawn up. And 
on the right is uh, a birch log cut in the summer of 1919 going into the stone lumber sawmill, five feet in diameter or a meter and a half in, in diameter, which gives you an idea of uh, the size of some of the, uh, the trees and, and logs that were existing in Algoma at that time. So back to the uh, surrendered uh, Batchewana Indian Reserve, which is in the gray around Batchewana Bay and uh, Goulet Bay. Uh, sales finally started happening in 1906. Uh, two large tracts were sold to uh, one John Bromley of uh, the Ottawa Valley. He was a lumberman from the Otto Ottawa Valley. And also to an individual, W.F. Wilson, who was from Brandon, Manitoba. Uh, there was a controversy raised in 1908. In fact, the uh, MP from Algoma stood up in the House of Commons and had a long speech about all of the irregularities that were involved in the Wilson tract. Uh, Wilson from Brandon, Manitoba, was a business associate of the Minister of the Interior and the uh, who was responsible for the uh, Indian Department. So uh, the minister basically sold uh, that track to one of his uh, business associates and, and, and buddies. And sort of to uh, rub salt in the wound, uh, Wilson, as soon as he got the patent for the, the property, um, turned around and flipped it uh, to uh, American buyers for 10 times for what he, uh, he paid for it. So he, uh, he profited from his relationship with the, the minister there. Um, the Bromley tract uh, generated two short-lived uh, hardwood logging and sawmilling operations. Uh, the Wells Higman Company of Tra Traverse City was running out of uh, yellow birch for their mill in Traverse City, and they thought they could use uh, logs and lumber from Batchewana Bay to supply that mill. So they set up in 1914 on Batchewana Bay. They built a, a short uh, rail line going up into the hills surrounding the, the lake, uh, but they only lasted for about a year or a year and a half. And about a decade later, Tillman Forest Products of Chicago, uh, uh, the Bromley tracked uh, to the south and again set up a sawmill, a logging railway, and they also ran into financial difficulties and lasted uh, just a year. Uh, their intention was to ship hardwood to uh, the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, uh, where Ford had a factory that manufactured the wooden parts that, uh, that went into the early Ford cars. Uh, and so 100 years later, uh, one of our OWA members, uh, Jamie Jacques, uh, was supervising an operation uh, near Goulet Bay and ran across this unusual feature running through the forest. So and he he was able to recognize that uh, that this was, this was an old rail bed, and here he is. I think it, you can probably see if you use a little imagination uh, running through the center of the photograph uh, is the the old rail bed of the Tillman Lumber Company Railway, a hundred years after it was put in. Uh, the rails had been pulled up long ago, and uh, and now we have a, a nice yellow birch uh, growing on on the old rail bed. I'm going to switch to a completely different uh, conflict now, uh, World War II, and I'll, uh, I want to describe an event that happened on January 30th, 1943, during the, the dark days of, of World War II. On the morning of that day, morning of January 30th, uh, three mosquito bombers took off from an airfield in Norfolk, England. Uh, they crossed the English Channel, and I'm going to indulge in a little personal history here. Uh, they they hit the Dutch coast, the uh, occupied uh, uh, North Holland, and if they'd flown in a straight line, they would have very soon passed uh, a town called Nordskowada, where my mother, then nine years old, was living. And a few minutes later, they would have passed uh, the town of Undyck, where my father, uh, 14 years old, was, was uh, living at that time. And Dad... Um, had a lot of interest about the aerial activity, uh, the Allied and German planes that were flying uh, in the skies over, over the Netherlands at that time. And if he'd noticed these planes, he would have uh, seen something very unusual. And that was the fact that British bombers were heading east in the daytime. And in fact, this was the, uh, the very first 
uh, bombing mission, uh, daytime bombing mission to Berlin that was uh, constituted by these three uh, mosquito bombers. The target uh, of these bombers was uh, Hermann Goering. He was scheduled to make a, a radio speech at 11 a.m. Uh, in Berlin, uh, and it was to commemorate the 10th rise of the Nazis to power. Just a few minutes before 11 a.m., the uh, mosquitoes opened their bomb bay doors, dropped bombs on Berlin, and uh, unfortunately, they didn't uh, hit Hermann Goering, but they, the bombs dropped close enough to the radio station that they uh, knocked the radio station off the air and prevented uh, Goering from making his scheduled speech that day. Uh, a couple of weeks later, at a meeting of aircraft manufacturers, uh, uh, Gehring vented his fury, and, and, and there are a couple of aspects to this. First of all, he was the, uh, the head of the Luftwaffe, and his Luftwaffe fighters weren't able to stop the mosquito because of the speed, of, the speed of the mosquito bomber. He was also the Minister of Forests, and uh, the mosquitoes were wooden aircraft, so that was another, another uh, insult to Gehring. And he said, he mentioned uh, that uh, the British were making this beautiful wooden aircraft uh, that all the piano factories were building. And the wood that was used in the de Havilland uh, mosquito was yellow birch. So yellow birch plywood, layers of yellow birch over a balsa wood core and the fuselage and the wings were constructed of, of uh, yellow birch plywood. Um, most of these aircraft, uh, nearly a total of nearly 8,000, were manufactured in England during the Second World War, but about 1,000 were built uh, at Downsview uh, in Toronto. And you can see in the photographs there, fo uh, pictures of the, the wooden fuselages being uh, built and assembled uh, to make the mosquito bombers. So where did the yellow birch for the, the bomber come from? Um, here's the range of yellow birch in Eastern North America. Uh, I don't think there's a, any definite answer to that question. Certainly uh, some came from Ontario, some from Quebec, uh, from the Northern parts of the Lake States, uh, from Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Michigan, uh, perhaps from the US Northeast, I don't know about that. Uh, for Algoma, there are references to yellow birch logs being cut for aircraft veneer uh, north of Sault Ste. Marie at Glendale, at Goulet Bay, at Haviland Bay, to the east of Sault Ste. Marie at Echo Bay and Bruce Mines, um, and along the north shore of uh, Lake Huron at Thessal and River. The statistics for hardwood log exports in 1941-1942 from the Sioux District mentioned uh, an export of 3.3 million board feet, which translates to about 400 truckloads in, in modern day truck uh, terms. Uh, and these would have all been uh, very high quality uh, prime yellow birch uh, veneer logs. And the exports from the Sioux, the Sioux District, went to Wisconsin. Um, there were uh, veneer mills at a number of locations in Wisconsin, Butternut, Marshfield, uh, Stevens Point, Oshkosh, uh, and it was the center of the American hardwood plywood industry. Um, these mills benefited from the presence of the U.S. Forest Service's uh, Forest Products Lab at Madison, which carried out research on uh, plywood and on the, the glues used to, uh, to hold the plywood together. So there's a, a good interaction between the uh, manufacturing uh, centers and the uh, the research carried out by the U.S. Forest Service. Uh, there were two main companies producing uh, veneer and plywood for the mosquito bomber in Wisconsin. The first is Rodas Lumber and Veneer, and that, that name is going to come up uh, uh, a few times uh, later here. And the second was uh, Northern Hardwood and Veneers uh, from Butternut, Wisconsin. And according to one source, 60% uh, of the mosquito veneer and plywood was produced by Rodis and another 35% by Northern Hardwood Veneers. Uh, this article is by a person named Sarah Witter-Connor, the uh, 
article, Wisconsin's Flying Trees. Uh, she's also written a, a book with the same title. So if you're interested in that little aspect of history, look look up Sarah Witter Connor and uh, Wisconsin's Flying Trees. She uh, is a granddaughter of Hamilton Rodis, who was the uh, president of Rodis Lumber and Veneer during World War II. So back to Algoma, uh, the uh, the other main producer of uh, of aircraft veneer was Northern Hardwoods Veneer, and they uh, set up a subsidiary in Bruce Mines, uh, Algoma Forest Products. And this article talks about the uh, the renewed log logging activity around Bruce Mines, where they were now cutting yellow birch uh, to export to Wisconsin for uh, aircraft veneer. And uh, an ad that appeared in uh, the Aviation Magazine in 1943 from Pluswood, which was another affiliate of, uh, of the Northern Hardwood Veneer Company, um, talking about this new, uh, very high quality plywood that they were producing. And, and one of the selling features was that they were producing this plywood for the uh, de Havilland Mosquito Bomber. And in the, uh, the list of subsidiaries or, or associated companies they mentioned, Algoma Forest Products, uh, they give the location as Bruce, Ontario, which uh, was actually Bruce Mines. Uh, there's a, at the end of their blurb, they say, right now for an engineering data bulletin that may help your thinking on the plans you want to have ready when the war is won. So they were already looking forward to the, uh, the post-war period when, when production of, um, or the consumption of, of plywood would switch from military to uh, consumer needs. 14 years after uh, World War II ended, Queen Elizabeth visited Sault Ste. Marie. Um, she hosted a luncheon appropriately enough at the Windsor Park Hotel on Queen Street. And this is her and Prince Philip entering the, the Windsor Park Hotel. And one of the guests they invited was Hamilton Rodis of Rodis Lumber and Veneer. He was then uh, nearly 80, flown up in his uh, private plane uh, to lunch with the Queen. And the purpose of the Queen inviting him was to thank him for the great contribution that Rodis Lumber and Veneer had made to supplying the uh, wartime needs for the uh, production of the Mosquito aircraft. So after the war, uh, <clears throat> the demand for, for plywood did switch to the consumer side and, uh, and with uh, mechanized uh, transport of, of logging uh, logs, it was possible to set up uh, larger mills. And the first to arrive in Sault Ste. Marie in 1948 was Rodis Lumber and Veneer from Wisconsin. So the, the wartime producer of the Mosquito Bomber now moved into the Sault Ste. Marie area to start um, logging and, and sawing uh, both yellow or yellow birch, hard maple, and, and white pine. And the logs that they obtained uh, came from freehold land, land that they had purchased, and, and the land that they bought was uh, some of the, uh, the blocks that were the former territory of the, uh, the Batuana First Nation. They also had a crown license. They could buy... Uh, timber from the Algoma Central Railway townships. These were the townships that had been granted to the railway for them to build the rail, the, the rail line. And there were small private landowners that were also uh, selling wood to Rodis. And the fact that uh, a lot of the wood came from uh, private property meant that they could export uh, logs to the US. So there was no restriction on exports of logs uh, from private land to the US. and, and at first, all of the uh, the higher quality veneer logs would go to Wisconsin. The saw timber would go to in Sault Ste. Marie. They did uh, build a, a veneer mill in 1951, and, and all of this was located at uh, Third Line and People's Road in Sault Ste. Marie, where there's, there's still a hard uh, uh, forest products complex there, but there's no, uh, there's no veneer production there anymore. They... Uh, they put in a flooring mill in 1954, and uh, the large uh, forest products firm Weyerhaeuser bought Rodis in 1960. 
uh, the other the location of the other another uh, large hardwood uh, processing facility was Searchmont, uh, northeast of Sault Ste. Marie. Hay and Company of Woodstock built a sawmill there in 1957, uh, and they sent uh, veneer logs uh, south again to uh, to Woodstock to the parent company for a while. Um, uh, the, the name of the firm changed to Weldwood in 1964. They were always a, a, a subsidiary of, of Weldwood and, and that name was formalized in, in 64 and Weldwood added a yellow birch veneer mill in 1967. So in 1966, this was uh, the, the yellow birch range in uh, Algoma was um, completely covered by hardwood licenses, uh, the largest amount to uh, Weyerhaeuser, uh, quite a, uh, the pink color, and that included their uh, freehold land, the Wells Higman block that had been part of the Batchewana Indian Reserve back in uh, the Robinson Huron time, and uh, the Duncan block, which was uh, once part of the uh, original Garden River Reserve. Uh, Weldwood held the licenses for all these uh, brown colored area. And there was also a, a, a smaller veneer mill in Thessalon and they had a license uh, north, north of Thessalon. That, that company was Birchland Veneer. So pretty much all of the hardwood was covered by, by licenses in 1966. And here's a couple of photos of, uh, of the logging operations in the late 50s and early 60s. It was still done by uh, Caterpillar Tractor in those days and the logging arch photograph on the left is Hay and Company uh, skidding some large yellow birch logs uh, along a skid trail. Um, the final conflict that I want to talk about is one that occurred in Lake Superior Provincial Park. Uh, start off with a peaceful scene. Uh, this is the beautiful shoreline of uh, Lake Superior. Uh, this is um, Sinclair Cove, a very pretty spot, very peaceful, but we're going to talk about conflict. Um, and the conflict had to do with logging in uh, Lake Superior Provincial Park. Um, the park didn't become very accessible until the late 40s and 50s. A uh, bridge was built over the Montreal River in 1948, and that gave access to the, uh, the very southern part of the park where Weld, Weldwood uh, eventually held a license. And there was a bridge built over the Agawa River in 1957, and the Highway 17 was eventually completed to Wawa in 1960. And so the, at that time, the, uh, the more northerly, larger portion of Lake Superior Provincial Park could be accessed. Um, Weldwood was cutting about uh, 400 hectares a year in 1970, and Weyerhaeuser uh, 3,000 hectares per year, and with all within the park. This uh, generally was not clear cutting. In fact, Weyerhaeuser could operate with as few as four or five yellow birch trees per hectare. So um, it was more a matter of uh, removing the best trees. Uh, building roads in and, and removing just a small number of trees in, in most cases. In 1970, uh, the Wildlands League uh, sent a task force to have a look at what was going on in Lake Superior Provincial Park. It was led by Bruce Littlejohn and Dr. Douglas Pimlott. Uh, another connection for me is uh, Pimlott uh, taught me wildlife ecology back when I was a, uh, a forestry student at the University of Toronto uh, many years ago. So that that's interesting. I did not know that at the time. He was renowned as a wolf uh, biologist, but uh, I, I didn't know about his activity in, in this realm. So they spent some time in Lake Superior Provincial Park, talked to uh, the province and to some of the operators there and came up with uh, uh, quite a list of criticisms. Uh, the first <laughs> was that that the operation was high grading, uh, cutting only the best trees and and leaving the worst. It was liquidation cutting, so it was very rapid uh, uh, removal of the old growth, uh, principally yellow birch, with uh, little regard to sustainability. Uh, the economics they considered were dubious, particularly if the uh, cost of silviculture 
was uh, considered. And that silviculture generally was inadequate. They saw that only about 5% of the cut area was being treated. Uh, and where, where there was treatment, sometimes the site preparation was very severe. There was uh, use of um, bulldozers with blades and, and they described some of these uh, bladed areas being football field sized. So uh, they, they reacted negatively to that. They noted damage to soils and streams by roads and skid trails, uh, logging roads and, and cutovers intruding into recreational area. And particularly, uh, they were concerned about the Sand River Hall Road that ran along the Sand River, uh, um, the Sand River being a, a very popular canoe route, and it seemed kind of in incongruous to have a, a hall road running in places visible uh, from a wilderness, supposedly wilderness uh, canoe route. Uh, and so a basic underlying question was, is this a park for timber? Is it for recreation? Is it for wilderness? Here's some uh, photographs uh, taken by my friend Jack Myhill, who's also an Ontario Woodlot Association member. He worked uh, in the area for the MNR in the uh, late uh, 70s and early 80s. So here's a pile of hardwood logs on a gamma to gamma road in, in the park, um, high grading uh, in the winter. A couple of photos of uh, uh, trucking along the O'Connor Road in the spring when the road is breaking up. You can see in the uh, the bottom right-hand corner a, a bulldozer pulling a, a logging truck along that very muddy road. So this is all happening in Lake Superior Provincial Park at the time. Uh, Weyerhaeuser operated a, a logging camp uh, located within the, the park, Camp 100, which refers to the fact that uh, this was 100 miles along Highway 17, north of Sault Ste. Marie. And you can see just a, a little bit of Highway 17 along the, uh, the bottom corner of this uh, photograph. So the, the logging camp was right on Highway 17. It was located a, a couple of kilometers north of uh, where the very popular Orphan Lake uh, Trail runs today. I like to go back and look at some of these places. So in 2022, I, I, I walked around this uh, old uh, campsite. The buildings had all been long, long removed. Um, the cleared areas are, are growing over. And the, the main evidence I found of the camp was this utility pole sticking up, uh, growing between a white spruce and a red pine tree. And this is the utility pole back in 1983. So it's always interesting to com compare yesterday and today. Um, the, the task force, the uh, Wildlands League task force mentioned the very intensive site preparation. Here's a, a couple of photos that Jack took back uh, in 1983 of uh, scarification or site preparation within the park. Um, you can see that it, it is quite intense. Here's a, an aerial photograph from 1974 um, along the eastern shore of Lake Superior within the park. Um, some very popular recreational areas. Uh, Catherine Cove, a, a beautiful picnic spot. Uh, there's a, a beach, a nice sand beach that goes between Catherine Cove and Sand River to the south. Um, there's a, a, a nice hiking trail that runs along the north side of the Sand River. And uh, Barrett River has a couple of nice campsites near its mouth. Um, and then if you look a little bit inland, these patterned areas uh, with the linear patterns, these were um, uh, reforestation projects or, or site preparation projects that were carried out probably in the early 70s. And, and at that time, the, the, uh, the pattern of site preparation showed up very clearly on the photos. And I decided to, uh, to check out what these things looked like 50 years later. So I, one day I hiked in along the uh, now overgrown Sand River Road to look at this spot. I also uh, walked into the uh, the Barrett River project. So in 2022, here's uh, the, the Sand River project. Uh, this was likely a, a yellow birch seed tree that had been left to sprinkle seeds on the site prepared area. It was uh, 
I'm guessing it was left as a sea tree because it had this big burl and a seam, and there's probably some logging damage down at the bottom here. The, um, the forest that had established on the bladed area was uh, quite a disappointment for me. It was a, a mixture of balsam fir and white birch without any uh, yellow birch, and the trees were quite small and slow growing, which probably is a result of the fact that the uh, the blading was so intense that it removed a lot of the organic matter from the area. Uh, at the Barrett River project, I did find some yellow birch. Here's a yellow birch tree that established there. But again, most of the uh, trees that established following this intensive site preparation were yellow birch and again, they're, or sorry, white birch. And again, they're not, uh, not all that large, uh, particularly considering that this is 50 years after the treatment. Uh, Weyerhaeuser undertook a, a publicity campaign um, in 1971. They were aware of the fact that the, uh, the, there was a controversy brewing about uh, logging in the park. And so they took out a series of full page ads in the Sioux Star in April 1971. The uh, ad in, on Earth Day, the second Earth Day, April 22nd, I don't think that was a coincidence. Uh, talks about how they're cutting the larger trees, allows the smaller trees beneath them to grow. Uh, hardwood trees need sunshine. We let the sunshine in. They also uh, played the jobs card, pointing out that uh, uh, 500 people worked at the, the mill in Sault Ste. Marie. And, and at that time, certainly uh, it was a large employer, the third largest employer in the Sioux after the, the steel plant and Abitibi's uh, pulp and paper mill. And they, uh, they made the further point that they would not be able to operate in the Sioux if it weren't the timber that comes from the park operations. So after this uh, controversy started brewing in, in 1970, there were nearly 25 uh, years of discussion about logging in Lake Superior Provincial Park and uh, uh, several iterations of planning. Um, by 1987, most of the, the veneer quality material had been cut out of the park and, and logging had pretty much stopped by then. And uh, eight years after the, the, the end of logging for economic reasons, um, the OMNR banned logging in the park in its plan in 1995. The uh, Searchmont uh, Mill, Sawmill, and Veneer Mill closed in 1988, and the photograph shows the, the remnants of that mill complex. Uh, there's still uh, forest products uh, work going on at Sault Ste. Marie, but the Veneer Mill part of that closed in 2000. Um, I, I want to end this by saying that yellow birch is still part of the Algoma forest. Um, the uh, it's a diminished part. There's certainly not as much being cut as there was in the past. The uh, size and quality is not the same as, uh, of course, the original old growth yellow birch trees that were once here. Uh, but there is activity going on. And uh, my little microcosm of the world, I, I do a little bit of harvesting. So uh, I've harvested saw logs and veneer logs from our woodlot. And here's a load of maple and, and birch logs, some yellow birch logs in that load going out in 2018. And I try to uh, to manage the birch that is on the property. And so here's a, a very vigorous yellow birch sapling that's growing in a, a group selection opening. Uh, I took this a few days ago, reaching for the sky. So thanks very much for uh, joining today. I wanna thank uh, the OWA for hosting this conference. And, and there's a, a list of uh, people who, who are sources, people and organizations who are sources for some of the material that I've presented today, and I thank them as well. Thank you so much, Art. That uh, that was that was really great. Um, your presentation really feels really felt like a story. And uh, I was thinking about what you said about storytelling at the beginning, and that really, really came through in the presentation. So thank you. Um, before we dive into q and I just would like to share a slide as we have a little something for you, as, as per usual. Um, so you were one of our speakers last year, um, and you received Around the World in 80 Trees, so we wanted to offer you 
Um, a different gift this year, uh, The Hidden Life of Trees. It's a, a really great read, so we hope you enjoy it. Oh, thank you very much, Olivia. I appreciate that. Wonderful. Well, we'll give folks just a second to put in a few uh, Q and A's. I see that we've already got some coming in here now. And while we just wait for a couple more, I'll just share our sponsor slide again. Great. So we've got a couple questions coming in here. Um, so if you don't mind, Art, maybe I'll just dive in and um, start to uh, start asking you a couple of them here. Um, so the first one that we have here is, were the Batuana First Nations people ever compensated in any form for the valuable yellow birch resource, which was extracted from their ancestral lands? Uh, a good question. I, I would say yes. I, I'm, I'm not sure uh, how much publicity this has gotten, but there's been a recent settlement uh, of the Robinson Huron. There's been an ongoing uh, claim uh, about the annuities connected with the Robinson Huron, the Robinson Superior Treaties. And uh, recently the claim was settled in court uh, for a total of $10 billion to going to the, uh, this is ju not just to the Batuana First Nation, but to all the, the First Nations involved in the um, uh, Robinson Huron Treaty. So a huge amount of money. Um, because the uh, government did not live up to its obligation to increase in, uh, annuities as was specified in the original treaty. Thank you, Art. Um, I see that uh, John would just like to jump in for a moment, so I'll pass it over to John before we continue with Q&A. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Olivia. I've, I've got another Zoom at one, so I'll, I'll be asking. Just great presentation, Art. But I just wanted to, to mention a bit of an anecdote. Um, the late Doug Redmond, who uh, was a former president of the Canadian Institute of Forestry, passed away, I think, about 10, 12 years ago. Um, I got to meet him and actually had lunch with him at the Officers Club in Ottawa. And he was a pilot of a mosquito bomber. <laughs> and he flew 30 missions over Berlin during the Second World War. Wow. And I, I can't help but think uh, or wonder if some of the yellow birch in that uh in that mosquito bomber of his, where it came from. And uh, just when we went into the officer's club, it was amazing. You never saw someone who had more respect from a room full of people who deserved respect themselves. It was pretty neat. I just yeah. wanted to tell that story. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, John. Um, there's lots of uh, thanks and appreciation in here, Art, but um, I'll read out another question for you. Um, there is a question asking, what is yellow birch used for these days? Still mainly plywood and veneer for any furniture? Uh, that's a good question. It's it certainly, uh, if 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 uh, the logs are veneer quality, they, they will certainly go as veneer and uh, they command a reasonable price. So yeah, for uh, veneer is used for, for things like uh, doors and furniture and, and the lumber as well, I, I guess is used as furniture. I, I, I have to admit that I don't really know of all of the end uses of, of yellow birch. Um, the amount that is harvested is far less than it was in the past. Naturally, that uh, that makes sense. It looks like they put uh, quite a lot of yellow birch into the, the aircraft during World War II. Yeah. That's something I learned today. Um, another attendee has asked, what are the biggest threats to restoring old growth yellow birch? Um, possibly insects and diseases or possibly degraded sites? Actually, I, I would say that the biggest threat to restoring old growth yellow birch is time because it takes a, lot, a long time for trees to reach the, the size that they once did, uh, a meter in diameter and more. It, it takes hundreds of years. So um, if, uh, if, if we're patient, they'll get back to that size. But I, I don't know if our, uh, in our forest management and current economic system, whether we're willing to do that. Uh, in places where, where uh, yellow birch is protected, the conservation reserves and, and parks, it eventually will get back to that size. Climate change permitting. Yes, of course. <laughs> Um, we have a, a hand raised here. Um, just before I get to the raised hand, I'll just ask you another question from the uh, Q&A. 
Um, mm -hmm. How do you create group selection for yellow birch if a few trees are present in your woodlot? Uh, a bit of a, a technical forestry question okay. there. Okay. Um, so there's there's a couple parts. Uh, yellow birch thrives on light, so you need a, a fair sized opening. So removing one tree isn't enough. Uh, you need to remove several trees to create an opening that's large enough. In the slide that I showed, I was lucky enough that there were some yellow birch already in the understory and they started growing very quickly when, when that opening was created. Um, if there's yellow birch seed trees around, um, you pretty much need to uh, have some disturbance of the soil for the seeds to establish. So they establish best on, on exposed mineral soil. Uh, so some site preparation is useful if you have seed trees, uh, but certainly not as um, severe as the site preparation that I showed in a couple of the slides. Thanks, Art. That's, uh, that's quite a, a detailed response. Um, <laughs> I'll just go to the raise hand here, Jim Farrell. Um, I'm just allowing you to talk now, Jim. Um, so you're able to, should be able to unmute yourself. If you would like to ask a question or, or provide a comment. Okay, great. Um, thanks very much for the chance. Hi, Art. Um, Hi, Jim. I'll be, I'll be quick here. here. Yeah. I know we're getting late. I worked in around the park from uh, 1977 to 1982. Know Jack Myhill quite well, and a number of the sites that you'd uh, you've mentioned there. I was I, I got to know the Sand River Road pretty well, actually. And uh, <laughs> of course, we were looking for for spruce, mainly spruce at the time for the for the paper mill. And we were allowed to start harvesting in the park in 1990 or 1980, rather, uh, five years after a spruce budworm infestation. So there really wasn't much to to cut after that. But I, I too visited those sites that were very heavily bladed art, and I think there was a mention too about prescriptions. Like given the wide distribution of of yellow birch, is there a diversity of prescriptions? You know, let's see, north of Superior as opposed to you know, uh, Eastern Ontario, Northeastern Ontario, or is it pretty much the same prescription from your, from your understanding? Um, <laughs> good question, uh, Jim, but my understanding isn't broad enough to, <laughs> to be able to answer that. Uh, I know that the, the prescriptions that were developed in the Algoma area were uh, uh, openings with uh, site preparation. These were pioneered by, by Harry Graham uh, yep. a few years ago. Yep. Uh, with seed trees and, and and that was often very successful so there's there are areas where uh where yellow birch established very well after that kind of prescription i don't know uh what was used say further further east in algonquin park or uh, areas adjacent to algonquin park where there's also quite a bit of yellow birch i don't know that yeah well, thanks Olivia, i'll just jump in for a sec um the only other thing in addition to what Art's already talked about is there is some uniform shelterwood management still with light scarification like Art has suggested used throughout the range in Ontario. So both group selection and uniform shelterwood are used for yellow birch. Thank thanks, you, folks. Martin. Excellent. And thanks, Jim. Um, I see one last question here. We're nearly at one o'clock. So we'll just take this last question and then wrap things up. Um, so we have a question here asking if you have any advice on improving yellow birch seed production when managing and harvesting it. Hmm. Seed is a fairly niche question. Yeah, um, I I don't have any direct experience with that. I I would think that that probably the the way you usually uh, improve seed production in trees is to to make sure that the the trees are vigorous and. Uh, and growing well and that that might involve removing some of the competitors to the seed trees to ensure that they have a full crown. Yeah, yeah, there's definitely a lot that goes into that. And um, I'd encourage that attendee to check out Forest Gene Conservation Association site for some more general information on that. Um, you'll have to take some time, Art, um, to just take a look at some of the comments. Um, a lot of people really enjoyed it. And there was even a homeschooling group who tuned into the presentation today. So that's fantastic. Yeah. Um, great. With that, I sorry, Art, you were saying? Uh, that's great. Yeah, I appreciate all the the very very nice comments. It's uh, gratifying. Lots of great comments here. We we really enjoyed your your presentation today. Um, and once again, we have the sponsor slide up there. So we just like to thank the sponsors and the committee members. 
um, Martin Dorothy and Jim Hendry, as well as yourself, Art. Thank you for taking the time to speak with all of us and put together this presentation. Um, and I just like to mention as well in the chat, we just put in the link for next week's presentation, talking about the benefits of windbreaks and fence rows, as well as the consequences of removing them with Dave Bray. And that'll be Wednesday, February 14th from 12 to 1 p.m. So thank you again, Art. We really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us and we hope everybody has a good rest of their afternoon. Take care, everybody.